there will not be in the hymn book today. And the first one is called Abiding Me. We invite you to stand if you're able. Let's get to worship in Jesus' is mine.
about surrendering everything to Christ. We invite you guys to stay standing if you're willing. If not, uh, we're going to do an oldie but a goodie. This is an old hymn entitled, I Surrender All. It is in your bulletin. So we would love for you to uh, follow us in worship. Speak through him. Use him. 
as the vessel that you've called him to be. We thank you for this time to spend with you today, Jesus. It is in your name that we pray. Amen. Amen. Let me see you. Solid rock and say, man, we thank you, Lord, for them, for those that are serving. Love it, love it. It is great to have you visitors. Thank you, thank you for being here. Um, last year, this time, uh, we were really discerning who the, the true believers were going to be because there was a tropical storm that was like hitting during Sunday. We were like, well, let's just go out there and see if anybody's there. And like 90 of you showed up in the middle of the storm, amen? And so we were like, you guys are crazy, but this is going to work well. We love it. We love it. Hey, I also want to remind you, uh, I guess I guess the college football season started this weekend. I guess, I guess Alabama had a game. Um, so what, what I need to remind all of our college fans, again, uh, when your team loses one uh, down the road, you need to come with just as much enthusiasm and joy. All right? Can you do that? All right. All right. I'm not even going to say roll time, but I'm just throwing that out there. All right? How that works for some of you Alabama fans. I, it's good for us to pause. Um, I, I just I want to thank Sharon. That, that bulletin that you have in your hand, and some of you don't have it because you didn't print enough. Sorry about that. But that bulletin, every single Sunday, we have somebody, and she is, Sharon is praying over these bulletins as she folds them and puts them together for our worship. We thank God for Sharon. Thank you, thank you, thank you, Sharon. Thank you for that. Thank you for that. Also, another hero in our midst is, um, is Ellen. Ellen is one of our golden gals. Again, they, they will take your shirt, your floor bed shirt, and pray over it and turn it into something that looks like you know it came out of Woodstock, which is which is coming back, by the way. All right, it's out in the clothing fashion. But our gold gals, Ellen, um, in celebration for her dad's 90th birthday, uh, he served our country 30 plus years. Phenomenal guy. She went out and helped raise over two thousand dollars for the Wounded Warrior Program, which is phenomenal. The last great hero that is here is there is a bachelorette party that has come to worship this morning. Amen. Where, where is our praise God? Thank you. Um, thank you for coming and partaking in the floor of Bama. And there, way back in the back, there she is. That's Brett. We love you. There it is. I'll point at her. Congrats. Congrats. There she is. My only advice is to make sure Jesus raises him up, all right? Because you're not going to be able to. To start off on a good note there, it is good to be in the house of the Lord. If you're visiting with us, uh, I hate to say it, but we're talking a little bit about money this morning. I know, I know, it's such a hard subject, and money, I know, is the first one you're coming to, so sorry about that. Money, money, money. Uh, the reason we're doing that is because Jesus, more than anything else, behind the kingdom of God, addressed money. So it's an issue. It's an issue. And so we're going to talk a little bit about that today. Uh, you're in for a treat because we've got communion and we've got an amazing baptism that's here. Uh, and before I do that, one more victory story. Um, there is a there's a bar owner. He and his, his significant other, Pam, Mike and Pam, own a bar in Orange Beach. All right? Now, a bar in Orange Beach, now, count me crazy, but it's kind of in competition with the bar right here, with the called Floor Bama. All right? But he came to know Jesus Christ in a miraculous way. He's going to give his testimony in a couple of weeks. But they are using their incredible bus, their bar bus, for Sunday after Sunday. And they are blessing people from Orange Beach, the bar over there, to have worship out here in the floor of Africa. I love that. I can do it. Thank you so much for what you guys do. So many heroes in our midst are writing a book. Because um, what we'll do is we'll just sell the profits and then we'll pay off the, uh, the, the debt that's left for the church and the bar all in one with all of your stories. Because they are, they're amazing what you do. Thank you for being that witness. Uh, last week we talked about the dark side of money. And you hear a lot about that. And, and we need to address that. We need to address that. Because in our culture and our society, I grew up with that beautiful poster on my wall. It had that, that huge mansion overlooking the bluff, and the, the shore was down below. It had like a four-car garage. 
and it had its Porsche and its Jeep and you know an additional Hummer and it had all the cars parked out front and, and if you guys have you ever seen this poster and down below it said the one who dies with most toys wins <laughs> I love that poster I did it I did I still to this day I love that I've told some of you man if you live in Alabama or on the Alabama line or down in in, uh, in Florida where we are if you don't have a truck you're really not a full man you know so I'm, I'm, I'm praying through that and this own desire we have a culture that says if you want it go get it do we not I mean yeah. if, if you think that's the desire of your heart go ahead go get it you earned it and how that works out and we talked about this last week is within our within the scriptures and our Christian communities is as you have more faith God will give you more blessing i.e. material blessing. How many of you think that's true? All right. In an extent, it is true. So it's a trick question, really. We're blessed. Many of you have. You have lots, and that is a blessing. God has given that to you. He has blessed you, and you need to go out and bless others. But what about those, our brothers and sisters, that are across the globe that have almost absolutely nothing? Do you see how that kind of comes in conflict for us? The more blessed we are, and even the disciples, when the rich young ruler came and the rich man came, he was like, Lord, I've done everything. I go to church. It's even in a bar every Sunday. You know that's like an extra 100 bonus points. But I'm out there. I attend worship, and I go, and I do this. I've been a great husband, and I'm a good father, and I'm doing everything you want. What else do I need to do? And Christ just paused and looked into the depths of his heart as he does ours, and he said, you know what? You need to give everything you've got. Just give it away because it's become a false god. It's the mammon that you've put up in my place. And brothers and sisters, there is no other god above our God and our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And, and that is how we live. And it's so easy for us. I know I battle with this week in and week out to take this mammon, to take this pursuit of false security and having the great 401k, having enough money to send your kids to school and all of the above. And if that is consuming, that's what Scripture is saying. That's wrong. Never place that. Allow that to have the power over you. It's interesting, though, in the Old Testament, I love the witnesses of those that were wealthy. God used them. It, it, again, if you're wealthy in here and you're in the top 10% of our society, great. We love you. Thank you. The end state to this thing is you've got to use that to continue to help bring in his kingdom. But the Old Testament, Abram was a rich in cattle. He had tons of wives because they practiced that back then, but, but rich in cattle and silver and gold, and he was just very, very blessed. And God said, I want to do this. I'm going to make an example out of him and bless you. Job, a man of great wealth, we know. You know his plight. He went through with all of that, having everything, losing it. Solomon, one of the greatest kings Scripture talks about. Thus King Solomon excelled all the kings of the earth in riches and in wisdom. That's what we need to talk about today a little bit. We can be wealthy. You can have it, and most of us are more wealthy than the rest of the world. I mean, we were just, we really are. We established that last week. If you own your own car, you own your own iPhone, you got a computer in your house, we're up there. We're in the top 5% um, when we look across the globe. But the Old Testament continued to talk about how God do that. So this is not a negative thing. I love the New Testament witnesses. The wise men. We enacted this at Christmas last, last year. It was beautiful. The wise men came, and they brought their wealth. They shared it. They lavished our Lord and Savior with their wealth. God gave that to them. God encouraged them. There were wealthy women. If you go back into Scripture, and you see there's a band of women, a great support network for Christ that supported Him financially and the disciples as they wrestled through that. Joseph of Arimathea and Nicodemus. In the very end, after our Lord and Savior was crucified, the wealthy within the, the society there came and they blessed and they took Christ and they buried Him. They purchased, they used their wealth for Christ. So the images are there and that's, that's scripture. We don't want to, we've got the dark side, now we're on the lie side and what it means for us because it really is God's money. But the most wonderful of all is how so much of what comes in is not a result of our doing, but it's a gift. It's unearned and it's unearnable. You ask any farmer, he can put the seeds out there, right? Did he create the soil? Not so much. Did, did, they, did that entire formula that took place, that harvest to come about, he had very little to do with it. 
Some of you, wonderful, you have, you've been part of a family and others because of their wisdom and the way they use, they've built and they've done great, wonderful things for big businesses. The very story of Don McGinnis and his dad is incredible. It is amazing what God is doing through them and the reason why the Four Bamas continues to move forward on this. It is incredible. It really, really is. But some of all of that is, is by part for what others have done and along the way, and really God being a part of that. It's God's ownership. And throughout the scripture, hear it now, God said that He has absolute rights. He is the owner. And you know what we have? We have the relative rights as stewards. That's what we are. We're stewards in this. God has always been about the business of messing up our economic capital. Has He not? <laughs> As soon as we think we have enough, something works through. As soon as we've got all the savings and it's there, an economic thing, there's a crash and there's a reality there. And part of you, if you were like me, you just watched all of that just be washed away. And we find ourselves still to this day, still to this day, wondering, what, how are we going to get by? And God's saying, I'm, I'm right here. I'm here. I love you. I'm never going to leave you. I promise I will see you through this. I will see you through this. But make sure you continue to put me front and center in all of this. In your scripture there, the Deuteronomy passage, you'll see this printed in your bulletin. I love this sense of jubilee that was practiced in the Old Testament many, many centuries ago. But at the end of every third year, what they would do is they gather the tithe from all of your produce, that's what God is telling them of that year, put it aside in storage. Keep it in reserve for the Levite who won't get any property or inheritance as you will, and for the foreigner, and for the orphan, and for the widow who live in your neighborhood. And that way, you'll have plenty to eat, and God, your God, will bless you in all of your work. They even had a 50 years, a 49, it was a cycle of seven years, the Jubilee. And what they said, what God demanded through the Old Testament Scriptures is, at the end of that Jubilee, the ownership of your property would leave your hands and it would go back to the original owner. Part of your harvest, everyone that was harvesting and had, you had to set aside a piece of that for the broken, for the lost, for the blind, for those that had not. And it was a practice of the community. It was beautiful. Now, I'm not big on giving my property over. I'm just, can I confess that right now? You're not getting my property. No, no. I'm making a house payment. All right, it's our big backyard, and you're not getting it. All right, amen on that. But the sidebar of this in the Old Testament was is God wanted us to realize that what I have is never mine. It's on loan. You are a steward, Jeremy. You are a steward of what I've, I've given over to you. And so that Old Testament passage and the practice of the community was there. And then you see in Acts, and this is the hard part of this. This is God is giving and blessing us, and we've got to do radical things to open this thing up. In the Old Testament community, uh, the New Testament, as soon as they come in Acts, it said they cared and shared and they shared their possessions. If somebody had need, and I had property, and they were broken, they couldn't feed their children, and I did not sell that property and work in that, the Holy Spirit convicted it and moved upon them. And so it turned out that not a person among them was needy. Those who owned fields or houses sold them and brought the price of the sale to the apostles and made an offering of it. The apostles then distributed it according to each person's need. And there are some amazing churches within our community across the board that are practicing this very thing. Part of our, our, our uh, tithe that comes in needs to go out to those that have a need that are broken. But this is very difficult. And what I'm recommending is it's got to start small in our life. As you're teaching your children and our teenagers what this looks like, it's got to start small. Last week we talked about labeling everything in your house. God owns it. It's for God's purpose. Now see what God wants you to do, right? We talked about those little sticky labels. Now I went so far as I put it on a screwdriver. But that's radical, all right, for me. Okay, it was hard enough. It was one of my favorite screwdrivers, by the way. And I put, I put my little sticky tab on there. I said, God, okay, use this. How would I use this screwdriver for your kingdom? What does that look like? i got to start simple here. So over and over again, when are you working with Habitat? What's the great day of service? How are you going to be blessing? Put this screwdriver aside, and I promise you, I'll show you how you're going to use that screwdriver down the road. I was feeling pretty good by the end of the week. It was awesome. And then my neighbor comes over. We have some of the most incredible neighbors in our neighborhood. Uh, Billy lives right across the street. He came over, and uh, he said, hey, I'm going to go help my neighbor who, in the storm, had this big tree that blew down, and, and I need to borrow your chainsaws. 
important a man's chainsaw is? <laughs> Where's my newly wedded girl right out there? Okay, if your man gets a chainsaw, all right, it is holier than holy, all right? You know, not another man touches your chainsaw, all right? Are you with me on that? You, that is to me. Whoa, whoa, whoa. Absolutely. Look, you want my, you want my teenage son? He, you take <laughs> Stefan. Stefan will work with you. Bring a bow saw. You go out there and work. And I kid you not, and I'm, I'm kind of playing the stretch a little bit. That was the first thought in my heart. I'm like, how are you going to preach to folks, Jeremy? You're not even willing to let your chainsaw leave the dog on the garage, man. And here you are talking about Do you see how easy it is for us? Do you see what that is? It plagues our society. Whatever we have, God is saying, I will use that at some point. I will. Only, only though, if you have the moment where you can pause and say, Lord, just take it. Just give it back to Him. Give it back to Him. I might start with a screwdriver, but I promise you, man, it's going to the chainsaw, and it's going to end up in your big truck. All right? And it is not going to be funny. But that God is going to use it and bless it and stretch it, and it will be a witness. Can you imagine what happens when we begin to practice stuff like this in our own community? And it's just a couple dollars, maybe just a lot, a little bit of what's coming in for you. Do something radical. You're in the drive-thru through McDonald's. If you eat McDonald's, they have the most incredible milkshakes. They're all heavenly. But if you're going through that, do something like just pay for the person behind you. Just pay their order. It's crazy, isn't it? Right? I mean, I, I don't have a little bit of a McDonald's budget. You know, I'm not going to spend any more than what I budgeted. But, but maybe that is. You're going through a toll booth across the bridge. Just maybe pay the next 10 cars that are coming through here. I, mean, I don't know what it is. But this is what I do know. Every single time we've paused and said, Lord, use the small, use what we have to bless and strengthen you and your ministry. Bring in your kingdom with it. It happens. It happens without a doubt. I told the story a year or so ago before in Mobile when we lived over there. Gatorade to us, just like the chainsaw, a Gatorade in the Mount household is a holy drink. Okay? You know, the, the kid, their friends that come over, they don't drink our Gatorade. You want some water? Good, I got some water for you, right? Here. <laughs> You're not, no, you can't have the Gatorade. It is the wonderful drink for us. It's become Red Bull now, but, but Gatorade was there for us in Mobile. And Stephen and Rihanna, they had this wonderful thing. They, they'd see the, the trash guys that would come through, the, the sanitation workers that would come in. And over and over again, they just continue to come back in and they're like, man, it's, it's burning up over here, Dad. Can we do something? Can we do something to help? Maybe, maybe, I don't even know what Stephen was. He was probably seven or eight uh, at that time. Was like, he came in and went, Dad, yeah, I think they need some Gatorade out there. <laughs> you remember the story? Yeah, Gatorade? Stephen, have you lost your mind? <laughs> you know, take a Gatorade out, man. No, the mailman, I see them. I see these guys that come through, man. They're sweating, they're hurting out there. We need some Gatorade. Whatever. Okay, great. I got it. Okay, let's get some Gatorade. So we did it every single week. Gatorade, cold, beautiful, amazing bottles, four of them, just placed right out there for them. And you know what happened? You know what happened? The weeks before, the months before, they'd come through, they'd grab the trash cans, dump it in there, and just flip it up into your driveway or off to the side, that ever frustrates you. I'm like, can't you put it straight back up for me, man? Really, come on. <laughs> they, and they'd be scattered all over the, the, the roads along our neighborhood. As soon as the Gatorade ministry started, every single one of those trash cans were set up straight all the way through the neighborhood. It was phenomenal. A small Gatorade ministry using what you have to bless others. That's the beautiful side of money. That is what God dares us to do. And it is exciting when the Christian community, when we as brothers and sisters, start to look at our budget and go, hey, it's not how much can I give God? I got to, I got to block out a tenth here. And the new question becomes, as Richard Foster says it is, it's how much do I keep for myself? That's different. And that's hard. And that's what he had to say to us in and through his word, and he continues to challenge us. We're going to make a new vow next week. If you guys are here, the vow of simplicity. It's the only way we really can combat it. But it might be a way that will help us step out and be a part of what this means when he blesses us and dares us to use his money, his resources, to change lives that are broken, lost, and hurting. Amen? Amen. One or the other victory.
three stories. I'm gonna invite, <clears throat> I'm gonna invite Olivia. Where's Olivia? She's sitting right up here. Where's my, where's our little basement? Jack, where is it? Here we come. I invite them to come forward, her mom and dad. Jack owns the barbecue pit right across the street. Mighty fine food and omelet here, but some of the my finest barbecue in the world right across there. They wanted to come. She wanted to do something today, right? We're going to go out in the water. We're going to do a little baptism. It is beautiful the way the Holy Spirit works at such an early age. Amen? Mom and Dad were like, why didn't the Holy Spirit work on you when you were back in 6 and 7? You know, it would have been so much better. But you come now, and we're going to do a baptism. And so I've just got one or two questions for you, okay? In front of all this amazing family. Look at these girls. Aren't they good looking? Kind of scary. I got it. Okay. Um, I'm going to ask you a couple questions. Do you love Jesus as your Lord and Savior? Will you follow Him? And listen to mom and dad and relatives and all of those that are in the church, wherever you are, as they continue to tell you about Jesus. Will you continue to follow Jesus from this day forward in all that you do? I will. Amen. Those are the right answers right there. I love it. I love it. Now, what's beautiful for all of us is now we make a commitment, regardless of where you're going back to or how that is, we are going to lift her up in prayer, in fervent prayer, those that remain here. We're going to make sure that she continues to be good on that promise. As she ebbs and flows, as she makes those teenage years, and as she goes through all of this life together, we have to make the commitment to help raise her up in the faith as the followers of Jesus Christ, as her family. If you will so endeavor to support her in her faith journey from this day forward, the affirmative is we will. We will. This is your family, and it is millions strong. It's the greatest commitment you'll ever make, and we love you, and we are so excited about being doing the baptism as we go down there. You ready? Yeah. All right. You guys grab a seat. Big hand there. She's phenomenal. Thank you for that. Yeah, all the communion folks, we're going to come forward. What we're going to do is we're going to invite you. We'll do um, intention for communion. We know we got a lot of folks. We're going to have five stations. The way we do the flow is you exit as you're seated, go out to your right, and this time you're not going to come back to your seat, okay? Once you're done with communion, what we need you to do is you're going to take communion, have prayer, do your thing, and continue to worship. And if you've got to go somewhere, we understand that, but continue to worship as we make our way down to the beach where we will conclude with a baptism after the service. So we've got two stations in the back. There will be three stations up front here, and that will be the logistics of that. But the beauty of what communion is is that Christ told us, He said, in this world, you will have trouble. I promise you that. You're going to have money issues. You're going to have relationship issues. But in this world, you're going to have trouble. Take heart, because I've overcome the world. And He had His group with Him. And he said, what is so beautiful is that this bread, on the night in which he gave himself for, for us, as he took it, he gave thanks to his Father, and he said, this is no longer a simple element for you. This is my body which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In those good times and in those bad times, as you break the bread together, be mindful and remember what I've done for you. And likewise, when the supper was over, he took the cup, and he had his team there, and he said, this is the blood of the new covenant. You don't need to sacrifice another animal. You don't need to do anything other than give all of who you are. And as you come to this cup, be mindful that this is my blood poured out for you. There's nothing you can do that will earn this. There's nothing in the world that will ever replace the sacrifice that I have given over to you and to the generations to come. This is the blood of the new covenant. And he gave thanks to the Father. And he gave it to his disciples and said, drink from this, all of you. And so as we come, we come before him in the sacrament on an outward and visible sign of an inward and spiritual grace. We come broken. We understand you're not perfect. We understand that we're all trying to make this thing through. We're not the judge. But what we offer and what takes place in communion, it's this, this reality where Christ says, you are forgiven. You are forgiven. You're wiped clean as you partake. So celebrate that. Take some of the body as a reminder as you dip it into the cup. Hear their blessing that they give to you. And then, as you so feel, make sure that you flow out to the beach. And we're going to conclude our worship on this amazing Labor Day weekend. 
out on the beach as Olivia makes that covenant and we do a baptism there. Will you pray with me? Gracious God, we are so thankful. Lord, we're so thankful that in the mess of our lives, in the uncertainty and, and, and the imperfections on the daily struggles that we have, Lord, that you meet us, that you meet us and you claim us anew. Wherever that place is, and you wash us clean, and you renew in us the belief that you've never left us and you never will. There's nothing we've done that can ever push you away. And so, Lord, we praise you and thank you for this gift, for the sacrifice of your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ, for Him being bled out, giving it all for us. We thank you. Thank you for this sinner's table, which we all are, that is open and it is a banquet set before us. Lord, receive our commitments to follow you anew in this day. Forgive us. We thank you. It's in your Son's name we pray. And all the people of God said, Amen. Amen. Won't you come and partake and we'll meet you on the beach. Baptized for she gets ready. <laughs>